budget matters, governance matters. Well, you can even call it some sort of, uh, you know, uh, well, I don't know if you use the word political participation, but it's a participation of sorts. But you'll understand why. Uh, perhaps to use that adjective, but you could change it if you want, depending on how it comes across to you. But we've got two gentlemen joining us here today to shed light on the subject matter. Sean Onigbide, co-founder and director of Budget. Thank you for coming on. Good morning. Thank you, Chen Valley. It's a pleasure being here today. Yeah, and we also do have uh, Joseph Akumbiade, who is also co-founder, chief technology officer of Budget. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Okay, so gentlemen, uh, welcome to the show today. And... and you know, well, yes, I mean, what you do with that report, many would have seen and aware of the projects that you undertake. But just backtracking a little bit, 10 years after, uh, you know, almost have, you could have an idea of how this story started. But perhaps if you say one, two, three years on, you might have seen signs say, wow, this is not going as I thought. Yeah. How did we get into this? Are we sure we can still continue? Yeah. What made you get into this particular field? Because this is an area where, for instance, young people will be immediately interested in. Yeah. Tell us about that. I mean, so I, I was a banker. Um, worked in a um, bank for four years. Um, um, and after a while, I, I felt I could do something different. I, I used to work with a public sector team then. Um, and it was around budgeting and uh, public financing and, and just looking at government reports and seeing where opportunities were. And I thought that if I could do this for the private businesses and the government and for the bank, why not for, for the public? I think that was the feeling I had then. Um, I didn't you know, imagine how big it could be. Um, and I also think I, I figured out was a lot of concentration on stock market, bond markets, private sector stuff. Um, nobody was really... Um, dedicated to analysis of the government uh, finances, even as an advisory work. Um, so that was the thing that came into my mind. And, and we, we were very lucky to have co-creation over that time. Um, so Boston CGI and Femi just started this incubation space in Yaba, which I believe was is, is the beginning of the history I mean, of this current tech ecosystem or revolution, as you might call it. And, they, and we were one of the few first people that got into that. And they had this hackathon called Taking um, Governance in 2011. And um, that was why I met Joseph. Um, and we, we just came together. Because I was going to ask, have, have you both <laughs> <laughs> always been like, way in the bank together? Or how, what no, happened? so it was that hackathon um, that I met Joseph. Um, he, he didn't even come on the first day of the hackathon. <laughs> and there was a guy who came on the first day and he gave us a glamorous picture of what he would do the next day. And he never showed up again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. well, well, Joseph, what kind of eyes did the Eskimo sell to you to make you tag along? Yeah, so, I mean, up to this time, I've been an entrepreneur myself, and um, somehow, um, I think it's a combination of providence and, you know, <laughs> um, understanding when I see an opportunity um, that I jumped on that. I remember, you know, when I got on the team, we were hoping for, the, the guy Olusha just mentioned, that the guy would show up for the hackathon with some, you know, fantastic product. And, you know, we called him an hour, you know, he would say he's in Maryland. A few minutes later, I mean, an hour later, he would say he's still in there, Jibo. So we kept waiting. But somehow, I had worked on something overnight, and I was like, guys, you know what, there's something here we can present. And somehow, um, you know, we presented it. We started working on the PowerPoint a few uh, minutes later after we saw it. And, of course, we presented, and it was something that uh, was chosen. You know, and that was the basis upon which um, you know we won and we started budget. Uh, you know, let me just say, Joseph, it's quite good to see you. I mean, I know you're always busy behind the computers <laughs> and the rest. <laughs> it's good to see you come out very rarely. Uh, but you know, I mean, this is not uh, like Facebook, for example. This is something I, I think you did for uh, I don't know, was it CSO sort of for civ civic engagement. Uh, let me just say and. It's 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 a uh, it's different from what a lot of people want to do. I mean, they would essentially want to start a business that will, I mean, make be the unicorn of the future. But you thought, let's do this for civic engagement. I, I wonder why didn't you tell the path of um, Facebook, for example, or an Instagram, for example? Why did you choose civic engagement? I I, I think um, wow that question. So I I think for us it was more of. Um, 
you know, seeing an opportunity to solve a problem, a problem that affects each and every one of us. And the fact that technology is something that I, a, a space I play in, um, you know, it was natural for me. Um, as at that time, we, we, we went to every sort of hackathon where we're looking for technology solutions to solve um, social problems. You know, there was Garage 48, there were a lot of those, um, you know, opportunities then. And, and so this so happened that um, I think there com it's a combination of several things that actually make it work out. There was Shaun there who was very passionate, um, and that's what he does day to day at First Bank. Um, and I've been an entrepreneur. This, I do it every day, nobody pays me, you know. As, an, as a tech entrepreneur, you're at home, you're paying for internet, power, and all that. And if nobody pays you, you know, you just have to keep grinding. And so um, it was such a huge opportunity. And today, I mean, there's no how I've been able to project that today we'll have a way of being able to build. Uh, it was just about, let's just solve the problem now. And of course, <laughs> 10 years later, it's, it's, it's become what it is now. And so let me just reel this out. There's open NAS, there's a state of states, Occupy Nigeria, open budget campaigns, even budget padding. You guys are, are known for some of this, I mean, setting up this and even co-setting up this uh, initiatives that I just mentioned. So a lot of people will definitely have come across this in some way. But uh, let me bring this back to Shio. I mean, uh, hearing what you said there and um, seeing how far you have come. And Shemelin was saying earlier that was there ever a point you thought, wait a minute, what are we doing? Why are we doing this? And uh, before we get into that one, let's, let's talk about some of those initiatives like Open NAS, uh, Occupy Nigeria, State of States. It seems these are your products yeah. <laughs> in some yeah. sense. I want to believe that's how you see yeah. them. Yeah, you're right. And because the mission at the beginning was very simple. Um, we want to put budgets into the hands of people and give them a route to accountability, to old government accountability, simple. Um, but as, you, as we moved on, second, third, fourth year, we figured that it was much more deeper, and the context is actually more complex than that. Um, so we started Tracker, which, was, which is a platform that tracks public service delivery, huge platform on social media. Um, they curate projects. We even ran a project with um, Channels TV, Oversight, um, which is like, a, we did like a quarter of a project going around the country and trying to oversee um, projects that are in local constituencies of lawmakers. Um, then we built um, state of state, subnational work. Then there's no need to talking about the federal government and without not talking about the state government. So we did state of state. We did open NAS. National Assembly should be the highest organ of accountability, but it chooses even not to be accountable itself. And so we got a bit of hope from Senator Bukola Saraki. We wanted to do this. And we had to be a lot of pressure for about three years to get the final National Assembly budget to be finally open to the public. Um, and that we did with an office in Nigeria, EIA. Um, so gradually, we, we, we also looked at beyond just budgeting to the entire fiscal government, fiscal governance space, uh, which we now look at, OK, we need to look at state level, we need to look at local government, we even need to look at fiscal sustainability. I mean, a lot of states are clamoring that we don't have money to pay salaries, we are borrowing. Let's look at viability of the state. Because in the end, we now figure out that um, the standard of living, the quality of life, is extremely important to, as the end go for the work that we do. Um, there is no point talking about transparency and accountability if lives are not being improved in the end. And so, and like your point, um, did we feel we were tired yeah. at a point? I, I guess maybe um, year two, I was really worried um, because <laughs> I, it was, we're not, we wanted to do big, I had big ideas. I mean, you can imagine, I remember our first grant was with Open Society, and we said we're going to reach 5 million people, and we're going, giving us just $30,000. And they just laughed. And so they 5 people, million people. 5 million. <laughs> and, it was, and so, when things didn't move fast, uh, maybe we're trying to reach out to a government um, and nobody was responding. I was a bit tired. Like, I mean, is this what we're doing? Is it really, is there really an opportunity here? Um, but I think in 2014, we get, we, and we're not also raising funds. I mean, funds were really challenging mm -hmm. in the early days. Uh, but we, gave, we got a bit of breather from Open Society and, and Media Network. And I think that was one that catalyzed that we can expand the team and we can grow mm -hmm. fast. Yeah. At that point, you know, where you thought maybe two years, mm. uh, perhaps because, you know, you, you have this idea, you brought uh, Joseph was mm. there as well. Were there times where you thought, okay, well, maybe if after three, four, five years, if, if it's not going as I planned, maybe some sort of doubt could creep in. And then, of course, you meet a lot of people today, young people, uh, 
no pun intended, who perhaps, it happens to everybody. Yeah. I mean, you, you start off something, you want to see that instant mm -hmm. result, and then when frustrations come, come in, people handle it differently. They have yeah. thresholds. Mm -hmm. So what was that point? Did you, how did you deal with that point? Did it ever come to you? Did you think about, if I'm this discouraged, how do I then convince every other person that, look, we need to keep going? Interesting is that I had a fail save option. So two things. One was when I was in bank, first bank, um, for one year I was running, working in first bank and still running budget because I didn't have the confidence oh. to leave the bank. So what I do most times is when... Fear of the unknown. Huh? Yeah, fear of the unknown. So I, I go, I get a get room in the evening, 6 p.m. I worked in the strategy department. I would go to Joseph's house, we would load all our tweets on tweet, tweet deck, we would schedule them, uh, we would do all the designs. So it, it looks as if I'm tweeting on the gun, but no, we already scheduled those tweets. And we, I mean, we did all of that for one year. Uh, it was getting the Ashoka Fellowship that guaranteed my pay for three years that actually got mm -hmm. me to say, okay, yes, uh, I think I can leave now and go out and do budget. So even I, I had those doubts early on to say, I mean, um, this is we, and I don't even want to know how big the non-profit world is and NG and grants. Yeah. So I was always constantly checking how do we even, how do we even survive? I mean, Joseph had his own private business going on, um, and so this was also like he was just uh, putting work. But me personally, I had nothing else beyond that. Uh, well, let, let me take this back to Joseph. So we keep doing back and forth, yeah. really, just so we get a rounded uh, view. So. Um, uh, yes, you've done a lot of work, and uh, I just want to get into the intricacies now. Uh, when people hear budget, they imagine that you have access to a lot of information, which you do. I mean, you see those figures, you see those secrets, uh, as it were. For you, over the course of 10 years, what would you say was um, or has been the biggest um, thing you found out, the biggest discovery, revelation? I mean in budgeting across states, federal budget padding, openness, and the rest. What would you say has been like the biggest discovery for you? Hmm. Um, perhaps mine might be different from what Olusio might have seen. So I'll bring you back to it. <laughs> um, I think first thing was to realize how the budgeting process happens, how, um, you know, when we started looking out for um, we, we, first, when, when we noticed that there were a lot of budget items being repeated year in, year out, you know, and that drew attention to asking questions around how do they, are the budget, um, the budget itself, is it prepared, you know, and we started asking questions. Um, I remember one of the first opportunities we had then was to work with the, um, you know, the legislators on um, establishing the NABRO office, National Assembly Budget Research Office, and, and each time the Executive brings the budget to, to the house to you know to pass it. I mean to defend the the budget. Um, it was always a sh very short time um, that they have to go through each and every one of the documents. So the um, under the FID FEPA project, we were brought in to um, you know to help them develop a mapping software. And during that process, we realized a lot of items. Um, a lot of things in the line. I mean the budget line items. The same project. So last year it would be construction of this road. And then this year, the same item will be repeated, and it will be called rehabilitation um, you know, of the road. And part of what even spawned um, the creation of Tracker for us, because we now felt that let's even know what's going on. As at that time, we don't have um, information on actual, if the actual budget item was funded, if, um, why is it coming back again? And, and so we wanted to know more. It, it, you know, it spawned our curiosity. So I think that for us was one very big point um, in, our, in our work. Um, to see how to start asking that question of how are the I mean the budget itself prepared um, for uh, you know before it is presented. So uh, for him, it's repetition yeah. of sorts in budgets. What is it for you? What was that biggest revelation? I, th I think I think it's more about interest about how um, the budget is a product of of private interest, um, and you might look at it from different angles. The executive put certain items in the budget just because someone sees a contract opportunity in there, not because it benefits the public in a way. Um, so you get a community and you're tracking a solar lightning power system. And the community is telling you that our biggest need is a school or an health center. Or you get National Assembly. Um, when the boy goes to National Assembly, you know, a broad is 5 billion naira. 
and somehow the road becomes three billion naira, and the two billion naira is fragmented into 15 projects of maybe 100, 100 million naira each for an empowerment program. You know, those are the kind of things that really makes us um, feel sad about the Nigerian project process. The people don't think of the collective. Mm. Uh, there's always this, um, this is the vehicle for me to get my own stuff done. Mm. And, and we've seen that um, we've agitated and we know we have this frivolous items uh, document that we take when the executive does the project, we take it to, this, to the National Assembly and say, these items, we think you should pay attention to it. I think the biggest win we had was in 2017 during the project padding that, that blew up and that got a lot of attention and everywhere. Most times it's been silently happening. And that's why you see roads. You know, take 15 years. The, the Oyo, Bumosho, Ilomi Road has been on since year 2000. You know, the Abuja Benin Road has been, year, has been there for years, for almost a decade. Because over time, people, the, the federal government budget, if I start with that, is not purpose for what it is. It's fragmented around different lines. And now, you now decide what, how, what goes into priority. And at the end of the day, you know, the executive still has enough power. To say, even if you put something in the budget, I would yeah. not fund it. But you know that at the end of the day, those that settled on partisan level and say, oh, you have, you have, we have to just do this because they are lawmakers, they are for our people, and for things like that. So for us now, I'm making the budget the policy instrument and just you know, using it to advance personal or, or political or electoral expediency. It's my always been my worry about the Nigerian mm -hmm. budget. Yeah. You know, what was the, because you know, when you said that uh, you were, the bank, doing advocacy work, certain things, you saw how things were turning out. At that point, correct me if I'm wrong, you know, you, you had access to those documents or those agencies provided mm. documents for you to work with. Mm. But at some other point, perhaps in this other case, when you went further, mm. you had to go seek mm. yeah. those documents. Mm. And of course, there was rejection. Mm. What was the turning point at that time when you now made that breakthrough and even though I, I'm not sure that's what's forthcoming, mm. as you'd like them to be. Yeah, I mean, so first thing is that even before budget, the budget, because of we had this Fiscal Responsibility Act of 2007, um, the, the budget was always public, was always on, on the budget office of the Federation's platform. Website. So it was there. I mean, no one was just interrogating it or engaging it as it should be, uh, or simplifying or bringing it to the mainstream. Um, so that was one. Two is, um, it also, as we, the, the quality began to deteriorate um, around being actionable and comprehensive. So if I said, that's what... Quality of what the budget? Of the budget, itself, or the line item. I mean, that's what we go with Lagos, but even till now, um, we say construction of roads, 40 billion naira. Which roads? What length of road? I mean, and what have you awarded to that road for previously? You know, those are the kind of things that citizens can interrogate. But if you say construction of road, I don't know what road. I can't be chasing you media to say, give me a detail about which roads you're not constructed for. Because you have not given significant discretion to choose whichever road you want to construct, where they should be more detailed and concise. That's how budgeting should be. Um, and those are the kind of things that we've seen over time, that people, and now you have empowerment program in maybe it's a local, local government. And you go there and say, okay, where this is a whole local government. Where exactly is the empowerment program happening? You know, and those are the kind of things that we now see lawmakers and the executive hiding under just not to provide that opportunity for people like us to further interrogate them. The, the worst of all is the constituency project of the National Assembly. Because out of 100, before, the constituency project were more about schools, roads, hospitals, and solar lights, and even some of them I could dis would be dysfunctional after a few times. But now it's all empowerment. Empowerment and empowerment, and then you selectively choose people within the community, possibly people of partisan nature, and you appropriate uh, public resources to them in a very, very open manner. And no one has been able to say there should be rules around constituency projects because it should be benefiting your constituency. Do, do you think that that's a way of uh, perhaps somebody trying to shy away from the spotlight so you can easily trace where some funds might have gone to? Because if those rules are not there, it always gives you a lot of leeway to perhaps freight that things away. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, we've seen a lot. I mean, we've seen someone convert an IT center to his own private cyber cafe. I mean, oh. We've seen someone put a pole inside his compound and say, "Oh, my compound is also part of the constituency." Oh boy! I mean, we've seen, you know, I mean, I mean so many examples. I'm sure if you get a tracker guy on board, he would, you would, you would, you would not leave this place. I mean, there's so many things you've seen about how. 
we, we, we've seen construction of you know, mosques, churches. I mean, if you even if you go deep down into state budget, it gets much more ridiculous. Mm. Yeah. Uh, let me ask Joseph, uh, has this stopped I mean, these frivolous uh, <laughs> trends that you've seen in the past? I, I don't know how many budgets you have scrutinized, but I mean, in recent times, uh, have you seen a reduction or perhaps a stop to all of this? Uh, uh, not at all. Um, oh. While engagement has improved with states, at the, you know, at the, like Olusha mentioned, we've had more partnerships at subnational level. Um, we still, of course, um, see those frivolous items. I think now we engage more. We try to let them see some of these things, and, and you know, it still boils down to the fact that how is this budget um, prepared itself? Um, we think that if the the entire process um, improves very well, and um, it, it is more um, citizen-centered, which is one of the things we are pushing now, um, citizen guides to, you know, budgeting and, you know, getting citizens involved in the entire process. We believe that we we'll begin to see a lot of those improvements. Um, for us, what we see is, like, you know, you just lift a template. It's another time to budget. Let's just pick um, the old template and then let's put it together and, you know, present. So um, if that process changes, we believe that we we'll begin to see that improvement. Frivolous item every year, you always say it. So you're uh, saying yes. 2021 budget, you still saw the trend? Yeah, I mean, we published a couple, um, you know, of those items. Um, you know, um, there's now this open treasury. Only you want to talk about open treasury, um, you know, um, where every spending that is done by the federal government also, they publish every single spending. I know a lot of Nigerians don't know that. Um, that every single item, every time money is spent, they actually publish those things. And we see a lot of interesting, um, you know, data um, looking through um, some of those information on the Open Treasury platform. Mm. So uh, I'll, I'll allow Sean to talk about the, the Open Treasury, uh, the Open Treasury, Open Treasury platform. But just, I, I'm curious, I just want to get this out of the way. We've heard that when you fight corruption, corruption fight fights back. back, right? Has that happened for you? Yeah, we, we've had a bit of pushback. I mean, security. Sometimes of our project officers, I mean, have been harassed, um, beaten. Um, we had one called Moses Mutoni, and we love, um, thanks to China, Syria, but helped us. I like that. I mean, um, we've had even our own office been, you know, been. I mean, we had local, you know, entire. I mean, I mean, I mean, people come and knock our doors and say, um, "You try." I remember. 2015, we tried, we, broke, we did some exposing on Lagos state financing. And we don't, we're not an investigative platform, so we don't snoop. We only take what is provided and interrogate it. And someone said, oh, we're trying to stop the former governor of Lagos State from becoming a minister. They kind of started, you know, and said, you know, people just started guarding up from our office, started making a scene. Um, I mean, it's just us being very dispassionate about our work. I mean, like you, you just have said, um, a lot of times, the, the, the budget, is, we, we hope that it, it improves. Because you see, we had a huge publication that even, you know, we ran into troubles with the budget office. I mean, because we're like friends and not so close friends. And we talked to them about some things is, something is very wrong with this current budget. Um, because we see maybe a school of oceanography in Victoria and installing solar lighting system in Bauchi. You know, I mean, I wonder, what is the business? Maybe, maybe they have a branch there. No, and it's because a lawmaker who's from Bauchi sits in the committee that oversees uh, the budget of oceanography and wants to allocate, and that's why we need a more intense work on the National Assembly. Because we should scrutinize the budget and make sure that it fits into the purpose of Nigeria. The National Assembly. Now, if at that point is where a lot of items are introduced, and I know even not that, not even scrutinize it. There is a bigger problem. And like you said, we've seen that pushback, and we are also not immune from the whole um, degradation of, of civic space in recent times. And you know, the CAC came up with a huge um, law, and I guess it's the karma. I mean, we're there. We're, we, we, Twitter is our biggest outlet for conversation, and that's been um, cut off recently. And so, so we, we also. So how do you deal with that? The, the it, it being cut off. We, we, we've kept it on. I mean, we're very clear with other CSO partners that respect what the government was doing. We were going to keep tweeting, and we never stopped tweeting. Maybe, maybe interactions have not been as strong as they used to be, evidently, but we've kept that on. And we also have other channels. Um, and, and the three, truth is, we have a huge grassroots campaign to True Tracker. So we, we're also not limited to the digital space. We also have a lot of influence also on the grassroots. But has the frequency of someone in one committee 
then he throws in a budget mm. that is in a remote area. Mm. Has mm. that frequency stopped in recent budgets that you've seen over time? It has reduced, but it has not stopped. And I think it's something that the executive has to come from, that how do you put a budget, a budget line item, that is not within the mandate of an institution. And we've seen the ministry, the, the, the um, I mean, NHRC um, inst inst installing um, uh, ICT equipment for a local community. That means the National Human Rights Commission budget. Installing an ICT. It costs some money in ten and because you say you want the budget to move past on time, you have to look at, take a higher way from all of that. And to think that we actually borrow to fund these budgets. Yeah, and that's why when you say you have a revenue problem, you don't just have a revenue problem. You also have an expenditure efficiency problem. It's mm. Uh, you know, I, just before we go to break quickly, I, I want to ask um, Joseph, because clearly the work you do demands a lot of funding. And uh, I mean, if you're touchlighting, as it were, corruption and the rest, mm -hmm. you clearly will not get funding from the people you are <laughs> scrutinizing, as it were. And uh, quickly, in, in a minute, if you could just touch on that, uh, the challenge of funding. I know you've gotten grants and the rest, but... Uh, in, in, a, in a bit to get funded, do you, do you get to, uh, do you have calls to compromise, perhaps say, okay, I'm going to fund you, but you know what, when the, the spotlight is coming to me, just dodge it, just skip me, and the rest. Is that something that happens? So first of all, uh, I'd like to say we, we don't get funded by government. Uh, we've never been funded. We're very clear on that. Um, as a matter of fact, we don't receive um, in honorarium for even, you know, doing training there. So that is first. Um, of course, our fund, funding comes from uh, largely from international donors um, who, yeah, somehow, I mean, we really have, we don't really have any compromise because it sounded like you're asking if there is a sort of um, donors that, um, no, we, we really have such donors. Most of our donors, we publish, uh, you know, who our donors are uh, and we talk about, um, most of them are also clear on the kind of funding they provide. Um, you know, every year or every season of, of their, do, of their um, you know, grants. And so, yeah, we really have, we've really had such an experience. Um, but in terms of local partner, I don't think, we don't have any of such, um, you know, engagement where we've had to. Well, you know, uh, talking about what you, you gentlemen do, uh, there's always been this part, it, it kind of comes up and disappears in the policy, which has got to do with security. Mm security votes, security funds, mm. and that kind of thing. Did you look into that area? What kind of reception do you get if you talk about, because some of them, they budget certain things too for security purposes. Yeah, there are security votes in the budget, but most times um, it's not ex they're not explicitly stated, especially at the state level. Um, so you, you would have that as part of, I mean, because most times when you check state budget, it's overly summarized. I mean, so you would just say um, chief of staff to the governor, um, 28 billion. And you find that the chief of staff, office to chief of staff, spends more money than even the education budget. And I've seen that often. I mean, if, if you read our last state of state reports, we had state, especially in the, in the south, east, south, south, even in the southwest, spend so much you know, on, 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 on the call it general administration. And so, and I know it's, all of that is talked in there because you don't even really get a detailed line item to what exactly that means. Um, but at the federal level, you see some lines of security votes, security votes. The true about it is it's an aberration because it's an extension of the military era. It's not anything um, known to democratic systems. But someone to appropriate funds um, and without any form of uh, accountability, or even to even hear things like security vote is directly paid into the account of the governor or the president. And so he has no and he has no accountability to provide. I remember the case of Governor Oji, uh, former governor of um, Abia State. I mean, he was claiming he spent almost ten billion naira or something. And it was all security votes that was given to local communities and he was using it to maintain security of the state. I mean, those are, those are the kind of things that I say, we have an ex expenditure efficiency, inefficiency. It's, it's gross. And so when we say we need more money, uh, we also should check about what exactly are we spending money on right now. Um, but it's something that the, the, the government, the, 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 the biggest problem here, and it's still the National Assembly or the state legislature, um, because it's, the, the way the country runs is 
you know, I, I'm doing mine, and so I, you do yours. Um, so I give myself good allowances, and I take care of myself. The constituency project, you get that funded. Mm -hmm. And so if you go and say, this is your impressed account, this is your security vote, that's good by you. Um, and until we're able to have a strong legislature, yeah. they can hold everyone accountable. Because the highest organ of accountability in a democracy is the legislature. Um, to be, and you cannot demand what you don't have. And so, in a way, that's something that we, even as body, are thinking in the next 10 years. So you think, as it stands today, the legislature is not as strong as it ought to be? It's not as strong. It's not as independent as it should be. And it's also not the service of value-driven as it should be. You, you know the Speaker and the Senate President, time and again, they've said, this is not a rubber stamp legislature. This is not a rubber stamp National Assembly. We're going to ensure we hold the executive to account. Hearing that and seeing things that have played out, do you still think that they're not independent enough? They're not, I mean, I mean, it's not supposed to be like a fisticuff, like we're fighting. It's, I mean, it's supposed to be that we understand that we have a mandate to move the country forward, but there are limits. For example, look at the Twitter ban. The Nationals maybe set up a committee and said they were going to look into the you know, immediate and remote causes of the ban. And they were going to come out with a paper and they're going to bring... I mean, that was how that ended. We have a platform where thousands and millions of Niger trade to share information, get learning, um, sell businesses. I mean, I bought the art painting just because someone designed something on social on Twitter. And, and it was lovely. Not expensive, but it was great. You know, there's an opportunity that you cut all of that off. Um, and, and, and you as National Assembly are supposed to, because you represent directly the interest of the people. You are the aggregation of constituencies. So, I mean, those are the kind of things I said. said that, no, the National Assembly should be defiant. Mm. You, know, you know, and you should be able to tell to the government, this is where we stand on these issues. Mm. I mean, it should be in that close proximity with the civil society on a lot of issues. Um, and that's when you get a um, functional democracy. If it mostly functions or works, it's because the national the parliament and the institutions are underpinning it are strong enough to stand. Mm. Well, Joseph, I mean, for you, uh, is there any, what's the thoughts, the thinking, in, in terms of um, getting young people to participate, ask questions about governance, you know, the budgeting system, what they put in there, has that improved? Is there any plan for budget to ensure that that happens a lot more? Because, I mean, if so many people have their eyes stayed on those figures, I think it will get them a lot more careful up there. Yeah, so um, what we've done is in the last few years, a we'll, couple of years, we've beefed up our um, investment in um, you know, development of what we call the active citizens. Um, we have what we call community champions um, in all the communities where we have our field officers. Well, our presence is in the, across 35 states right now, uh, where we actually organize town hall meetings. So we get these people um, right there where they are in their local languages. We try to help them because, you know, we are talking about citizen participation. You have to look at the literacy span across, you know, yeah. every spread in the country. Um, so we, we try to get them involved by, you know, showing them, uh, you know, in the way they can understand what exactly it is that is the content um, of the budget. And so um, with the community champions, we are driving that. Um, another thing we're doing is with the, uh, our civic hive. So we've got this um, accelerator program where we get young people who's got, um, just the same way we're incubated and, you know, budget was formed. We think a lot of young people across the country have got great ideas, um, you know, civic ideas. And so we, we've been supporting them. Um, one of such products is Gavo. Um, you know Gavo, the impact they've made um, greatly. And, you know, supported a couple over the years. And so very soon we'll be making call for application to, to get people um, just like Sharon, just like myself, who we throw in their ideas and, you know, we we'll get to incubate them and teach them how, you know, our secret sauce in a way um, so they can go to their local community and also, um, you know, make and create impact. Yesterday, as part of our anniversary also, we organized a hackathon mm -hmm. where people came in with their ideas. And we said we want, we want to raise the next budget. You know, and you know, we had a winner. Um, even those that did not win, we had so many brilliant civic tech ideas, which we think um, is a way, you know, to increase the pool of participation um, in, you know, civil society. Yeah. You know, you know, part of what I mean, you have said time and again is that uh, you look forward to, um, you know, other, and I think the hackathon references and other, you know, 
organizations, as it were, that can address other verticals that are still under serious perturbation, in your words. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'd like to know, I mean, you are into civic engagement, the whole budgeting process and, and the rest. What are the problems, if I could use that term, still need to be solved in this whole civic space? Wow. I, I think what is just one, one thousandth of the possible um, you know, social problems um, that exist. You agree with me that there are a lot. There are endless um, solutions. And, and you know, I'll try and point out a few ideas. Something that we see every day. Mm. Um, I recently started asking people questions that why would someone, why would people be crossing, say, on the Korodu Road, see people crossing under the bridge, where there's a bridge and people crossing the road. Mm. Then governments, um, you know, in trying to solve the problem, brought barbed wires and put it on the road. And a few, few weeks or a few days later, they pulled down the barbed wire. You know, there's a problem, you know, uh, and it's something we call that budget, we call, you know, a human-centered um, approach to solving social problems. When you want to solve such problems, you need to get the citizens involved. That is a solution. That's, a, that's an idea somebody can take on. How do you engage, um, you know, with the citizens? How do you engage with the government, you know, on seeing that problem? And that's just, you know, um, amongst many other ideas, social ideas that are around us. So we, 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 we are looking for the next person who beyond just the idea um, has the drive to push um, you know, and engage local communities at local government level. We, we have people who are pushing, who are driving um, PVC, doing PVC drives, telling citizens to, against next election, if you are complaining, if you're tired of this government, um, get involved, get, go get your PVC. Um, those are social, um, you know, um, civic tech ideas. So there are a million and one of such ideas which we think um, you know, people need to. So when you come into our civic high, um, program, for example, we are going to help you to reframe your problem. Um, whatever problem it is you are trying to solve, we help you to reframe it. We help you go through ideation process, prototype the idea, test the idea, um, and possibly introduce you to donors in our network. So those are the kind of things we think um, we help drive and increase the pool um, of civic engagement. I mean, out of those one million and one, you gave out two for free, mm -hmm. which is quite interesting. Yeah. One on communication, the other on PVC. Very brilliant ideas, as you said. I imagine someone uh, thinking and working on that too. Let me just say thank you for that one. But, you, you know, you, you've come up with a lot of things in the past. And um, one came to mind, and I just wanted to get an update on it, what's happening with it. The Buhari Mita. What, whatever happened to it or what's happening <laughs> with it? Maybe both, both of you might want to take that. that question. Okay, it's ready to show. So Buhari Mita is not our product. We built it mm. for CDD, Center for Democracy and Development. And, uh, and I think that was just it. Um, so it was our development, but it was not our product. So we don't know, uh, I would say I would be able to speak. Because from time that. to time I get to visit the website and it's, it's non-existent anymore. So I just thought to get updates on that one. Yeah, and, and that's the thing about civic products. You know, you, um, and, and also maybe sometimes do not fund it. Mm. You know, um, and that's why even the way we approach things, um, we approach as a whole, like, as, I mean, so for example, track, we've had donors come and say, we're funding you for six months for three sites. But the question is that the project we're tracking would not be, might not even be completed in, in, in six months because maybe the first six months of the year, the allocation has been provided. Are we just going to walk away from that community? Mm -hmm. So even for us, we, we tend to deliberately know that when we have products, we make sure that they stay long. And we like tracker, we've kept all our project officers on. And we're lucky that we've gotten what we call institutional funding. Um, so that when we have gaps in funding, we like illuminate step in and they help us close those gaps. So if somebody walks away after six months, we're able to get illuminate to continue for another four years mm -hmm. in that community. So do you feel, does the budget have it all covered here? Because I see you're talking about op you opened offices in what, Sierra Leone, Ghana, mm -hmm. uh, and countries like that? Yeah, we have offices in Ghana, Sierra Leone, Liberia. We opened them last year. We're thinking of Senegal, Kenya, and possibly an office in the U.S. Um, next year. Um, so um, that's part of our own thing that the idea that we have is valid everywhere. And as much as we're trying to expand, we also want to deepen our work more in Nigeria. Um, bring on board people who call them likely partners. Um, so likely part so faith based organizations. Oh. Um, um, road transport union you know, workers, and drivers. Maybe. What's intent? That would be interesting. Though. Yeah, uh, those <laughs> faith based. Or what, what's the I mean, idea? because we also understand that there's a huge. I mean, we, we call them source of civic power. You know, there is a huge influence they have. On the, on the, on the congregation. Oh, I thought you were going to be looking into their budget. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> we just want to be able to recruit more people to 
push on the issue of governance. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're not, I mean, and drivers. I mean, so we're, we're developing you know, and have to have, if someone is driving, you can be able to say this is a portion of the road that is bad, and also the intensity of, 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 of all of that. So, in a way, being able to bring new people on board, even the Gen Z, the NSAs give us a new opening that there's a huge interest within that new, within a new generation. We're 10 years in, so definitely the, the generation behind us or people behind us see things differently, maybe beyond that. So uh, we have to include them. So. Quite, quite interesting. I recall Occupy Nigeria, mm. too. Um, uh, just quickly, Occupy Nigeria and SARS. Mm. I mean, those moments, mm. do you think they achieve a lot? And, and this is why I say it. I mean, yes, we talk about citizen engagement, mm. and, but when you look at voter participation over time, mm. It has dwindled. Mm -hmm. Even though we've had this highlights, we've had budget doing its work for ten years, mm -hmm. but still voter participation, which is a major part of democracy and engagement, mm -hmm. is dwindling. So, really, what's going on? I, I, I think one, it's a generational thing. So we will agree that there's some stimulation of technology, even over stimulation of technology, if you call it right now. So I guess with the current voters that we have, the sophisticated. But I think that all that queuing up, you know three hours, four hours on the, on the voting block. It sounds a bit odd for them. Um, and also a whole of way we, we, we do voter registration. The movement has not been easy. A lot of people register in schools and they're back home because schools are closed during the election period. A lot of people register in markets and markets are closed during the election period. And that's why I'm happy that I make and we need to do more, in, in, more intense drive, you know, for, for people to be able to move the voting population, for voting booths, and, you know, to your places of residence. That's one. Two is I also have to bring technology into the process. Um, there's this resistance to technology. And I tell people, you don't have a problem transferring the million naira from your, from your phone, and you trust that that process is secure. I mean, there might be, there might be error, but that is one in a million times, you know, you might have to put that process in. So why don't we trust technology to, to vote? I mean, what's the big deal about us using the two-factor authentication? Mm. to vote. I mean, why don't we strengthen our identity system that if I have a name number, I use my name number to vote and things. Those are the kind of conversations we bring to the table. But, you know, I, I wrote a book called Existential Questions recently. And one of the things I say is that Nigeria tries to avoid its critical questions. And so they're trying to create different alternatives just to make sure that they can manage interest. And then but as things go on, uh, as it becomes more sustainable, We'll be forced to ask those questions, and which brings us to the issue of like VAT that is currently on the table right now. As things begins to shrink, um, mm -hmm. those questions that we avoid around productivity, around world views of different uh, ethnic, uh, ethnic structures, around different things that we know divide us, but we choose not to look away for them because we have found a political solution. We'll be forced to ask those questions over the time. Um, so for us in budget. Whether participation is critical, we just need to do more work around bringing technology to the place. We need to make it easier for people to vote. And we ask ourselves to accept that we need to strengthen our conversation that the footing is part of civic duty and it must be exercised. Yeah. Well, okay, as we wind down, Joseph, give us your, your, your perspective and thoughts in terms of uh, what the kind of impact you see those tools, your activities having on the electorate moving forward, either getting them to ask more questions, and as a result of that, they get a lot more interested in participating in the process, whichever way they deem fit. Yeah, so um, absolutely. So first is our platform gives people opportunity to even request for information, for data, um, you know, because in asking questions, you need to have the right um, data for you to ask questions with. Um, so, so far, that, that, that will achieve to a, a large extent. I remember Ruben Abati on that President <laughs> Jonathan talking about that even Okada, Okada right there now can ask <laughs> questions. Um, you know, they know the items in the budget. And that is something to a large extent um, that, was credit, that has been credited to budget. And so we, 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 we want to do more. We want to simplify this whole process more. We want to use more technology. Um, in the next couple of, in the next three to five years, we'll be investing heavily in artificial intelligence, um, you know, in data science, to, you know, making the data serve people um, specifically based on their need. Um, you know, sometime last year, we launched a product um, called onme.yourbudget.com, which is a personalized data set um, for individuals. So you can now subscribe to say, you know what, I'm interested in 
data from this particular local government. I'm interested in data on this particular sector. You know, so you can then start using those data to ask, you know, based on your area of interest. So if you have people with various interests, uh, even contractors, even, you know, uh, being able to use the data to serve whatever purpose they have, then you have, you know, more citizens um, writing, asking the right questions at the point where it pains them, where it touches them. Um, concerns them, yes. All right, then, gentlemen, uh, Joseph Akumbiade and Shio Onigbide, thank you very much indeed for coming on. And, well, the next 10 years, we imagine it will be maybe times what? Two? Rose to the power of what? Ten in terms of what you've achieved. Well done, gentlemen, yeah. and we wish you all the best. Thank you. All right, well, back in a moment. Don't go away. It looks as if we're talking a lot of. Um, Economic matters, but well, I think this time around will be slightly different. But we've got Mr. Emmanuel Ijerere, he's a man of many caps, he's a, a former member of the National Economic Council, he has chaired uh, Agri Business Committees, he's worked with former ministers of Agri to come up with the Agri Transformation Policy. He's also chairman of the Modified Value Added Tax Committee. Uh, during the uh, former head of step of Bangladesh era. And so he joins us this morning to shed light on some of the things that are making the rounds today. Good morning, sir. Thank you for joining us on the program today. But if I could just uh, start off straight away, why did they call that modified value added tax committee in the first place? Yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, yeah it was called modified value added tax because value added tax is principally um, adding whatever value has been added to any um, business activity, like manufacturing and so on, that extra value is what you tax. But for Nigeria, it was recommended that we should also include imported luxury items. Because the imported luxury items were not manufactured in Nigeria, it cannot really be said to be a value-added tax process. So that's why we call it modified value-added tax, to allow for this importation being tax of luxury goods to discourage the importation of luxury goods to Nigeria. Well, there's been a lot of talk about the revenue base of the country, which has been dwindling, I mean, for a very long time. And I think that conversation may still go on for years to come if certain steps are not taken. And today, uh, we talk about having to borrow to fund the budget states, having to borrow to ensure they progress. I mean, today, there are reports that some governors say they had to borrow to pay salaries. So from having been around working with different government agencies and committees and groups to ensure that the economy improves, is it that we're helpless or this is how it has to be for a while? How long more? What, are, what do we need to adjust to ensure that we boost the revenue base of the country? It's to allow for efficiency to be the basis of uh, progress. Right now, there's too much politics and less inter intellectual input. Most of the states of the Federation are capable of increasing their revenue base through internally generated revenue. But because they have been spoiled over the years of going to Abuja and collecting money at the end of every, every year uh, for spending, and also creates a situation where since the people are not the one contributing this money, it makes it a lot more difficult for uh, them to see a situation where whatever government spends or misuses, they have no say in it. But if you paid your taxes through value-added tax, to income tax or other taxes, you can challenge the government. And I think that that's one of the issues we are looking at. We have a lot more capacity at state level and at the federal level to collect a lot more taxes. Not through double taxation, because double taxation ends up with taxing the same people over and over and over again. But expanding the tax base, we don't have that in this country. And again, the number of expenditures that we go in for are absolutely responsible. A country like Nigeria, I, I, I hate to say this, but why would Britain, with its economy, have a head of state, the Queen, 
and the head of government, the prime minister, neither of them has a private plane with which they travel. But Nigeria, in our level of poverty, so it's a situation of we creating problems for ourselves. Um, there's no need to look out there to see where the problems are coming from. Let us first of all believe in each other and say, let us tell each other the truth. Let us cut down. Let us cut down on the amount of expenditures that are irresponsibly being um, carried out. Thank you. Quite interesting to hear you say that most states are actually capable of being viable. I mean, raising IGR, just that they've been spoiled over time. And, you know, for a lot of people that have, you know, debated this in recent times, you know, they've come at different points, you know, from different perspectives. You reference the political perspective. But if we could just take everybody back to perhaps when this began, and, and I think helping people understand the transition from sales to VAT, what exactly played out then, so people cannot better understand how we got here with a view to understanding how we can move forward. So if you could just help uh, our viewers understand how we even started this whole VAT process in the first place. Uh, first, it was a recommendation by the World Bank because they observed that a lot of the states were not really financially viable, but they could raise a lot of capital, a lot of um, tax from their own basis because they have noticed that some states, some very progressive states, legal states will be mentioned here, had already sales, had started sales tax. And with the sales tax, they were trying to raise entire revenue, revenue to improve their own income. But it was not very efficient. And I'm going back to 1991-92, when the quality of people who were administering taxation at the state and federal level we are just civil servants who saw it as a job. Whereas taxation is a profession that should be taken very seriously. And they recommended, therefore, that Nigeria should replace sales tax with value added tax. They made this recommendation to President Babangida's government. And they now, in turn, set up a committee and asked us to be a working group to come up and tell the government, first and foremost, whether value added tax is working in Nigeria. It was a 28-man committee. We were given six months to do this, but in four months, we came up with the conclusion that value-added tax is viable in Nigeria, but a number of things needed to be put in place. That, then they now converted us into the modified value-added tax committee. And we went to work, got examples from very many countries, especially developing countries, and we came up with a report we presented to the government. The salient point where there is first and foremost, validated tax was a replacement of sales tax. Sales tax was conceived and was seen by the states, and therefore that revenue was meant for the states. The thinking was that you want to create competition between states so that they can do well, they can improve on their collection capacity. However, when we presented the report, in 1992, only for us to find out that the, the Supreme Military Council, what it was their military government, <clears throat> changed it and said that, oh, uh, it will no longer be the, what we, we presented to them. That is that each state should collect its own tax. But because their system was not strong enough, we had a commission that would act as agent for them collect the monies for them, and at the end of every month, present the report to each state and say, this is the amount we collected from your state. We will take out 5% of it to train your people that within a period of four or five years, this commission will come to an end and the state government will have enough manpower to collect its own value added tax. So when the report, we now presented the report, it was very clear and we, before we even presented the report, we had discussed with the World Bank, and we had discussed with a number of technical people, including the chairman then of the Federal Revenue Service, uh, then Chief Olon Muleke, very, very cerebral gentleman, and with a number of state governments. So, and they were happy about the report. We took it on to the federal government, and the minister at that time was very happy with it. 
and then present it to the federal, it's called, it was then called the Supreme Council. After a number of decisions have been taken, it got to the Supreme Council, and when we, we, we now heard that the Supreme Council changed it and said that, no, we sh it should now be taken over by the Federal Revenue Service and all the revenue should come to the federal government, which in fact goes, um, destroys the actual foundation of the principle behind value added tax. So, what happened? From investigation, we discovered that a number of military men in that uh, Supreme Military Council saw the figures we projected as revenue accruing to individual states going forward. If this commission were allowed to collect these monies with the state governments, and the amount was huge for them. And they said, why should this be left to the states? I remember we were running what can be called a unitary government at that time. So immediately they said, no, this money must not, the federal government must not lose this money. And so they decided that you should go to the value to the um, Federal Inland Revenue Service, who at that time, at the beginning, were not really ready for it because the, all the things that were put in there that required to be done where well, they had not been implemented. So it, it was a situation that it was so bad that one of our members, one of the most prominent people, one of the best economists Nigeria has ever produced, the late uh, Professor Samaluko, said that he was going to carry a one-man placard and go to Abuja carrying his placard, showing that the, the, it was unfair on the states to do that. So. The committee was set up by the federal government, and it's, we submitted a report to the federal government that was little we could do under the military government. So that was the situation at the time. And on, coincidentally, it's now coming back to roost. What we warned Nigeria about is coming to that back to roost right now. In, in what way? How, how do you mean? Because of the matters that have gone to court now? Yeah, we said the whole idea, the whole origin of validated tax is to help boost state taxes so that they have a lot of expenditure to deal with. And it's easier to do this at the state level. And we also said to the federal government, you can take the one that is coming from the ports for the imported goods. But whatever was, was being uh, uh, collected at the state level should remain in the state. That is what is being challenged right now. Each state should collect its own taxes and use it to develop its own state. That is where we say that was the, the, we, that was the, at the beginning the government, federal government accepted it. But when it got to that small group of uh, powerful people, they changed everything around without considering the consequences. You know, uh, one of the articles I had read, they were talking about uh, you know at that time when they had sales tax, there was no uniformity, so they had to see how they could unify some of these things and give it a proper shape. So. Are we not in danger of getting back to that kind of scenario if we don't handle things right now? Because something that if we decentralize, you might just face the same kind of scenario again. Uh, for me, things have changed considerably. The state internal revenue departments have become a lot more computer savvy. They have become better educated. They have well-structured people including the Federal Revenue Service, all of them have improved. So what prevailed at that time that required the commission to do it on their behalf is no longer applicable today because the states have grown to a better position. However, doing this is a matter of reconciliation. If we, we cannot run away from the fundamental that validated tax should be collected at the place where it was generated and used for the people from whom it was generated. That's basically what uh, the point is here. It is, it will not create any problem, except there is failure or refusal to reconcile with each other. That because of what has happened, if our report was taken the way, the way we presented it, it should have been a lot better, and we wouldn't have had this kind of problem. But having gone ahead with all these years, over 20 years of these problems, we need to sit down and then rejig. It's not difficult to rejig, but we must not run away from the fact that Nigeria is a federation. 
and each state should be able to take care of its own revenue and its own expenditures. So it's not, I'm not afraid of any serious issues. A reconciliation can always be done and a better rejigging can be necessary to do this. So uh, if I get you correctly, you, you, you say that for this to work, I mean, if, if, I mean, we don't know what will happen at the courts anyway, but you're saying that yes. essentially the FIRS will still need to work with states or the states will also yes. need to work together with other states for the reconciliation. Which of them? Absolutely. Absolutely. Exactly. You've got it right. That's exactly what I'm saying. Everybody needs to come to the table and work together what is best for Nigeria and for the community. But, but with what we've heard so far, I mean, governors have different perspectives. You hear the River State governor saying this. You hear the Aboy State government governor saying something else. So clearly, it appears as though everyone is still uh, sticking to their positions. But, you know, tax experts tell us that, you know, VAT has the input and output mechanism, as it were. And, and it's good we're speaking to you. You're not just, I mean, renowned tax experts. You also have the benefit yes. of what happened in previous years, I mean, from the scratch with this VAT. So regarding this, this new conversation, will the input and output uh, mechanism be a challenge, and how can that be resolved? It will be a challenge, but it will not be difficult to resolve. What this means is that bottom line is that it's the final consumer that eventually bears the tax. But at various levels of the value chain, taxes are being charged. That's where the reconciliation issue comes in. And that's why computerization is very important to do this. It cannot be done manually. And it can work itself out. It's not difficult at all with the today's uh, technological advancement of the world. So I do see as yes, the input, output, that is an issue. But it can be resolved. And I, do, I, I, I see a situation where the quarrel will be where were the goods consumed? So you don't have a situation where you've charged VAT in a particular state, it goes to another state, another VAT is charged, and both parties are paying to the those states. Whereas in actual fact, VAT is the, 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 the final consumer should bear the VAT, not the manufacturer or the seller of the goods. Uh, but in practical terms now, because I, I, I like to look into the future and see how this will work. See in the debate, the build-up, the way some have pitched this conversation. Uh, some say it's a region against the other. Some say it's one party against the other. Seeing some of these colorations, which you say clearly does not help. The workability, uh, do you see the states working together in spite of you know, the political considerations and the rest, some thinking that, well, uh, it's, a chain is only as strong as the weakest link. That, that's what the Aboyne State Governor said. And he thinks that, well, the federal government should still be the one collecting this. So if, I mean, who knows what the court will say, if this now happens, how do you see those states now working together still? What the Aboyne State Governor is saying is, what bringing it side by side with the report we gave to government in 19... 92 was this let the federal government collect on behalf of the states but make the money available to the states to the quantum of what was collected in that state well i can accept that but again you have a, a situation where this is so politically polarized right now that states should not be given that autonomy to determine what they discuss and what they agree yes i agree that it's not possible for any state on its own to start collecting and then you create a situation where there will be double, triple, quadruple taxation of VAT. I agree with that. However, we must not run away from the principle that Nigeria is a federation and the, the collecting money in a state and sharing with another state that could also now go back to where we have always been, that the states don't bother to uh, put effort in their internally generated revenue will come back to bear. But when you say to them, you will spend only what was collected in your states, then they will become a lot more serious about it. So I'm just simply saying here that it's possible to find a solution, but it must not be imposed. The Constitution has made it clear. I don't know what the cost will come up with. Whatever the cost come up with, 
I doubt very much whether the mindset of states and the federal government will be the same anymore. Mm. They will still have to sit down on the round table to work out the best way so that at the end of the day, that final consumer or the various consumers of uh, those paying VAT will not be double or triple taxed. That is what we need to be done to, mm. to discuss it. I think we now have a debate going on and we can continue with that debate. But that debate can only go on if all parties recognize what the principle of that, what the principles of that are, and then we can now sit down and work it out. To me, it's not a problem at all. You deal with the level of technology we have in terms of figures and so on. That can be done very easily. Just get this proper software, and it will be done. So when you then say that you think it should be collected from where it was generated. Uh, do you also think that government can distribute to the quantum with which it was generated? Uh, so how is that what we have to do to ensure we address the question or the possibility of multiple taxation on those who are moving from one place to the other, the manufacturers? Uh, well, the, the, all right, if you take a particular product that is produced in Kaduna, and that product, when it's produced in Kaduna, the manufacturer sells it to a wholesaler. The wholesaler charges VAT in selling it to a distributor. The distributor takes it across borders, takes it to the final consumer, and they charge VAT there again. That is where the input-output VAT comes in. That's where you now do a reconciliation within a certain time limit when this can be cleared. We took this into consideration in our report and we analyzed it very well. So if we have the situation that has been created in 1994, has to be corrected first. First, what is the principle of that? Who are the people that are supposed to benefit from that? Once that is done, it is workable. It is that problem of moving from state to state if the goods that were produced in a state are all consumed in a state, then there's no problem. It's when you now go across borders that you start having challenges. Mm. Was there any part of your report that was even implemented at all, or was it entirely jettisoned? No, it was not entirely jettisoned. It was what uh, the part that was jettisoned was the fact that a commission should be set up specifically for a period of no more than four or five years on behalf of each state to collect on behalf of each state and be accountable to each state. And that commission had a duty to render the accounts in a detailed basis and to train the people in terms of technology to be able to collect VAT. That, that was, those were the ones that were jettisoned. Everything else was applied, but because of the collection um, authority, it became it had to be adjusted one way or the other before the law came into being. Well, if your committee report was implemented then, what scenario would we have today? We'll have had a system where there will be automatic reconciliation technologically. In other words, each state is running its own commission and they have a way of working with each other using a common software where the eventual, we are able to identify the eventual, eventual final consumer who should bear that tax. It is the state in which that final consumer resides that will eventually benefit from it. All the other ones that were, that were done before were only theoretical uh, uh, progression, which were meant to trace the, 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 the value chain through which that particular, those particular goods have gone. So it is not a situation that you have, you, what is going to happen is that identify the final consumer, see all the other people that have now charged, and then create a reconciliation. The person, the place where it was not consumed, will not be entitled to the final income on that value-added tax. Was this supposed to have any bearing 
with uh, payee whatsoever? Eventually, yes. The thinking was that, is it, uh, like I explained a number of times, our thinking at that time was that, like what happened in Indonesia, in Thailand, and in Brazil, value tax was used as a means of reducing the income tax of individuals. And it was a way of adjusting the social injustices that exist in the system. If you work hard, you get paid, you pay tax at a particular rate, usually the same rate, regardless of what effort you put into it. Whereas in value added tax, the poorer people paid less tax because they consumed less luxury goods. And so you can use this value added tax to reduce the level of payee that people are paying because the quantum of money is coming in from value added tax will grow and it will be more for people who are consuming luxury goods to pay this money and reduce the pressure on the uh, poorer people in the society. Uh, as it stands now, we're looking to the court, the Supreme Court, the Court of Appeal to at least uh, let us help us know which way forward to solve this impasse. And clearly there is a big issue. States like Rivers, Lagos. We've seen Ogun now recently even following up yes. the law at the State Assembly who say that, well, this is how it should be based on the Constitution. So if this swings the other way, the, the way of the FIRS, for example, uh, I, I, I don't think, I don't know if that will have solved this, the, this whole challenge for you. What do you think about a, maybe a political solution? If it swings the other way, what do you think should follow? What should follow is let's sit down around the table. The law or the court does not take away from the rights. The right is that the final consumer pays tax so that his welfare can be looked after by the government that where he's resident. On the other hand, the federal government also has a case in the sense that you or your right stops only when the other person's right starts. In other words, there are goods that go across borders. Therefore, the way out, whether the, whatever it, whatever happens in the court, it valid tax will not be the same anymore. Assuming the court say the Supreme Court says that the value added tax should still be collected at the federal level, the revenue. I assure you that there will be no end to it because what's involved here is a huge amount of money and states who have political, respons political responsibility will not allow it to stay there. So the fighting will continue, the confusion will continue, and sabotage may come into it. So the best approach is whichever one, I, I would prefer that both parties start sitting down now to start talking to each other agreed some principles and then we start working on that this can go on for many many years and create confusion because at the end of the day the loser is the taxpayer he does not know who to pay to if i pay to i end up paying to the, the, the federal revenue service the state government says pay to us as well that is the that that is the victim so to avoid and protect this victim from becoming a victim let us sit down around a table intellectual discussion will be what we should come up with. That's what I'm really suggesting. And that report that came out, let's look at that and adjust it to fit the today, Nigeria of today. That's the recommendation I will make. That the courts cannot bring this to an end because mm. you have woken in the minds of states. Mm. So I, I believe... States. Pardon me. I believe you're, you're, you're offering that report again to be reviewed and adapted to the realities of today. Yes, I am. Yes, if they still have it, I don't know what happened to it eventually. It became a subject for the law, the VAT uh, law that came up at right. the end of the day. So, and then it's over to the then Ministry of Finance. If, if you could just broaden this a bit, for you, do you see this as a key to unlocking that seemingly impenetrable door of uh, fiscal federalism? I believe it is the beginning, yes. And what happened, if it was, I believe that it was a civilian government we had in 1994, what happened now would never have happened. But it sorted out 
at that time, and the report will have accepted because all the states we visited were very much in support of it. Even the military governors in the states saw it as a, a place where they could earn income to increase their own internal generated, generated revenue. I believe that it can be sorted out and can be sorted out easily. The courts cannot solve it. All right. Uh, the legislators that are coming up now, they need mm -hmm. to understand what that is. It's not as easy as I've seen some of the laws that have been that have been now been passed. They, some of them are not realistic. But nevertheless, when we come together, we can amend those laws to see that we work for Nigeria so that the final taxpayer does not become a victim of the fight between the two elephants. Which of the laws are not realistic? The one by the state or the one uh, operated at the federal level? Some of the laws that I've seen, no, no, at, mainly at, at, the, at, the, at the state level, many state legislations came up not remembering the fact that goods move from states to states. You can only make a law for your own state. You cannot make a law that affects another state. Yeah. That's one. The other one, you have the modified issue of it, goods are imported into Nigeria. Regardless of where that port is, it's still a federal revenue. So both the Federal Revenue Service and the State Internal Revenue Service need to sit down together, bring them together and say to them, let's work in a manner that suits the Nigerian taxpayer so you don't overburden him. So uh, uh, just to be clear, do you, was it a good idea for the states, uh, Rivers, Lagos, to have followed with that law that we saw recently, the VAT law, that is? Well, I think, first, it was triggered off by the judgment in Port Harcourt. And they, now, they have virtually accepted as a military uh, legacy. But now the legal angle has been brought to it, and they have seen and tested it. They've even done the calculation. If you look at newspapers, the amount of money that are collected in the number of states, and what quantum, what quantum of that money comes back to them. That has now triggered that off. I assure you, they will not keep quiet. There are people who not want them to keep quiet. But the laws they have made now, in some cases, do not show the reality of how much money should eventually come to them. Because the fact that goods are manufactured in your state does not mean that the value added tax is payable to your state. So those are the, uh, the reconciliations I'm talking about. Let everybody come together and understand what the rules of value added tax is, what the basis are. That is what I'm actually saying here. All right, uh, Mr. Emmanuel Dijiri, former chairman, modified value added tax committee, former member, National Economic Council, and a chartered accountant. Thank you very much indeed for your time this morning. Thank you. Let's get some emails. Oh, I'll yes. Uh, quite interesting conversation. And as you'd expect, <laughs> we have quite interesting messages. Uh, let's see. Which one do we start with now? Uh, let's start with this mail from HK Eze. Let's see that one. This one is on VAT collection debate. Saying relics of military rule continue to haunt us even in the implementation of VAT. Goes on to say that if there is anything we should be thankful for, it is that we now have a democracy, no matter how dysfunctional it is. The journey to true federalism is gradual, but sure. Uh, Timi Afalabi says... VAT collection is simply a unitary government practice. It's against the principle of true federalism. But permit me to ask where the interest of the masses is in all these noise? Where are the projects to show in the lives of the masses based on the revenues collected by the states or federal government? Going forward, accountability for our revenues must be made compulsory by operators of the system. Festus Akimboyawa on governance and information sharing says, Kudos to budget for holding government accountable and offering hope to Nigerians. Government at all levels will be more successful if they see groups like budget as partners and not foes. Uh, I recall the Minister of yeah. State for Budget National Planning saying that, well, if, you, if, if we don't like you or if, you, if you're an enemy, we're not going to open our books to you. So this is in light of that. Budget yep. should look at how well FG spent the billions of dollars it has borrowed 
in the past five years. I wonder what informs that kind of thinking in that quarters. Well, here he says, uh, citizens' voices and open governance, he says, the real enemies of the state and the fences capable of destabilizing the nation are corrupt officials and corruption. As depressing as the revelations are, is there anyone taking notes? Wouldn't those infractions be repeated in the 2022 budget? What then is the story at the level of the state? Well, thank you, budget, for daring. Oh, still on budgeting information, John Ugolo says the greatest gap in budgeting in the federal and state government is the absence of appropriate vision. The politicians and public officers who present annual budget focus on how much is available to be spent and not how result-oriented the budget is. Oftentimes, the capital projects have no concrete feasibility studies, cost-benefit analysis, and environmental impact assessment. Above all, there is no effective coordinating mechanisms to ensure that the overall expenditures fit into national or state vision. That is why funds are channeled wrongly and there are no concrete and sustainable results. Mm -hmm. Well, let's end with Joshua Badon, who says, we certainly have a lot to do as a nation on accountability and stewardship. Constituency projects handled by lawmakers in most or the various communities are laughable. Even the acclaimed empowerment is mostly tailored to some selected party, well, partisans. <laughs> oh, okay. We'll come to talk of security votes to government at all levels. Such funds are not accounted for, he says. Why? I don't know. Talk about engagement, right? Yeah, Thank maybe that's where you can start off. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the show for today, everyone. Thank you for watching. I'm Kaido Kikilu. I'm Trang Balunasaw. Goodbye.